Yeah, hello everyone. Excited to see all of you here. Um, please share in the chat where you're zooming in from. We are always excited to see that. And to have our community of XR enthusiasts and developers grow. Um, yeah, as you know, um, we are having regular sessions behind the scenes and XR unboxing um, career career um, sessions. And uh, we are particularly excited about today's. But before we start introducing our speakers, I would just like to present XR Bootcamp to you. And our focus is on, yeah, on educating VR AI developers, on connecting them with the industry. And, um, and we have already achieved uh, to create a very great XR Creators Discord community. And I'm all um, inviting everyone to join that. Um, we will again share the invite to that Discord channel in the chat here. So feel free, feel free to come join there and also discuss um, your projects, your questions, anything you want to know um, over there in this course. And um, yeah, our courses that we are offering, we are always focused on portfolio project creation um, courses because we are seeing that from all our industry network that that's really the important thing that you have to showcase your skills and that's more important than any type of certificate. So yeah, feel free to check out our classes on our, our website, exabootcamp.com. And yeah, and we are also since um, we are already uh, giving courses for over a year already, and we're happy to say that our students are always very, very happy about the network, about the mentorship, about the course offerings. So from beginner level to advanced, um, we, uh, we definitely have you guys covered. And um, if you are joining the alumni network, that's also a great, um, great tool to get connected and to work on new um, creative, innovative projects together with others. Um, yeah, Ferhan, do you want to maybe share a little bit more about our learning path at Excel Bootcamp? Yes, definitely. Uh, thank you for this introduction, Rahel. And um, yeah, as, um, as Rahel mentioned, we are known for master classes and boot camps, upskilling programs, and these free events that you can actually ask directly to the experts. Um, as you may have already followed that we have uh, actually uh, launched the foundations and prototyping bootcamp, which is interesting for, for, for uh, everyone, especially if you don't have so much knowledge on Unity and VR development, and this is a perfect start for you um, to start um, uh, your career upskilling journey for VR AR. And, um, we also have uh, advanced programs, which we are running for uh, for the last 15 months um, on advanced VR interactions, rendering optimization, and HoloLens class is actually a master class with mixed reality is also coming up. Uh, we are actually working very closely with um, also we are on that. They have an amazing team and they always want to push the boundaries on uh, complex interactions and uh, optimization and other uh, important parts of a, a typical uh, industry uh, project on uh, VR uh, platforms. And we are working very closely to, to help the um, developers, designers there to achieve the, the best results. So um, maybe a little bit, uh, I can give um, an idea on uh, our foundations bootcamp in the next slide, uh, the, you will see that there is actually, um, even if you don't have any coding knowledge, we are also uh, opening a pre bootcamp that you can also get coding and knowledge for VR development. Uh, the, the bootcamp is starting in January, mid January, but if you want to take the pre, uh, pre bootcamp, uh, it will start in this November. So we have uh, our applications open for this program. Um, one of the foundations bootcamp already actually finishing um, in five days. And uh, we will also have the prototyping bootcamp, which is starting uh, in actually uh, four days, uh, I can tell you. Uh, in four days, we are starting the prototyping bootcamp. And in foundations, you are learning the basics of like coding, unity development, VR development fundamentals, the toolkits that you need to know. In the prototyping, 
we are mostly focusing on uh, fast uh, having you fast track your VR development experience, and you are um, creating four prototypes in one month on different use cases. So it will not only help you to fail fast in a supervised environment, so you gain experience. It also helps you to create a portfolio that will help you while applying for uh, jobs, internships, uh, gigs, um, or for your even uh, finding clients as well. Um, so after that, there's an MVP stage that you are polishing your prototype uh, into a level that can be actually be um, used at least in an, um, uh, like a basic functionality uh, for your own projects and for client projects as well. Um, and this, this prototyping bootcamp is only available for those who can pass our eligibility test or who have already done our, one of our foundation's uh, bootcamp. So um, without further ado, I would like to um, introduce our uh, guests today. So um, Matt and John is with us today. Uh, so they have done an amazing um, commitment to spend their time today with us because they are very busy. They have just recently been invested and growing the team. Um, every month, uh, I, I am hearing that they grow bigger and bigger. So uh, thank you for joining uh, today, Matt and John. Um, just to give uh, maybe a quick um, intro about them, John uh, began uh, his recruiting career 13 years ago um, on Cryptic Studios, and uh, he um, he also um, get a degree from UC Santa Cruz. And uh, after Cryptic, he joined Oculus to grow Oculus uh, from 200 employees to 2,000 in the first few years. Um, and then afterwards, uh, he also um, joined um, uh, Slack. And afterwards, uh, he is now a senior recruiter at OsoVR. Uh, Matt is the CTO and co-founder of OsoVR. He also has um, a great, um, especially AAA game studio uh, and game development career from Electronic Arts to THQ. And uh, he also joined uh, be uh, in different various roles in these um, game studios. And now he's leading the technology side of one of the biggest um, VR studios on enterprise, medtech enterprise. And um, so I would like to welcome you both. And thank you again for joining us today. Um, today, as you know, we will talk a little bit about what it takes to be part of as an uh, in an enterprise XR um, team, if you are having a game development background, how difficult it is to step into that industry. Uh, so we will learn more about that. Please, uh, if you are asking question, please, um, anyone can submit their question on the Q&A tab rather than the chat. Uh, in chat, it's a little bit difficult for our uh, moderator to uh, follow uh, the questions. So I, I recommend that you submit your questions in the Q&A tab. So uh, John, Matt, stage is yours. You can share your screen and uh, happy to hear more about uh, your advice and tips. Great, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen and get started here. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is John Patucha. I'm the senior recruiter at Oso VR. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and my experience as a recruiter who's worked in games, uh, virtual reality and enterprise software. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I, I studied literature at UC Santa Cruz, which was a lot like summer camp with books. It's in the woods, in the forest, near the coast in, in California. Um, after college, I ended up getting a job in, uh, in recruiting at a small game studio called Cryptic Studios, who make uh, massively multiplayer online role-playing games, um, such as City of Heroes, Star Trek Online, and, and Neverwinter. Um, I originally started my career kind of leveraging my lifelong love of comics and films and special effects. So I, I started by recruiting artists and animators 
Um, and shortly thereafter, I was, I was recruiting for every department and discipline at the company. Uh, after several years in the games industry, I was recruited to join Oculus right as the Facebook acquisition was, uh, was closing. And I helped scale the company from 200 employees to over 2,000 during my first couple of years there. Um, I did eventually leave to join Slack, and I helped them grow from a private startup to a public company, and eventually they were acquired by Salesforce. Um, Salesforce was not a super attractive uh, option to me, even though um, they're you know, a great company, a large company and successful, but I started to kind of look around a bit. Um, I considered a return to games or virtual reality, but knew that uh, I wanted to work on something that helped people. Um, but not in the way that every tech company in the world kind of tends to say that their product or app helps people, even if it's really hard to see how it does. I wanted to have direct, obvious impact in really helping people. Um, and as soon as I heard about Oso VR and their mission to use VR to train surgeons, improve patient outcomes, and democratize act access to the latest surgical techniques and medical education, I knew that I wanted to be a part of it. Um, I love games and I love movies, but more and more, it's the practical use of VR that excites me the most. So I joined Oso for many reasons, but their emphasis on scaling humanely was one of the things that stood out the most to me. Uh, I got to return to hiring creative folks like 3D artists and game programmers, but without the grueling crunch uh, that's become so commonplace in the film and game industries. We have a company culture centered around collaboration, caring, and empathy. And uh, our team members tend to enjoy much more of a work-life balance than they may have when they worked in, uh, in games or film. Um, and for anyone who's wondering, you know, the kinds of things that we tend to look for in candidates, uh, I have a few things that I'd like to mention. Um, Matt will get a bit more granular uh, after I speak on uh, tools and technologies and languages, um, but I wanted to provide kind of a, a high level overview. So, I think um, it's important that your resume highlights your notable projects, uh, responsibilities, proficiencies, and accomplishments. It doesn't have to be and really shouldn't be multiple pages listing everything that you've ever done. Um, some of this may sound pretty obvious to you, but uh, you know, if you're an engineer, include a link to your GitHub page and any side projects, games, or apps that you may have created. If you're an artist or designer, uh, be sure to include a link to an active portfolio or work samples and uh, make it easy for others to see the work that you're most proud of and where you've been able to have the most impact. Um, examples of, uh, of, works, uh, of work or projects that you've completed is ultimately you know, more important than a degree to us. Um, and one thing that, that can't be taught is passion. So I think it's really important that you let your passion for your craft uh, kind of show and stay curious and avoid complacency. Um, hone your existing skills and consider developing new ones based on where your interests lie. Experiment with prototyping, you know, join meetup groups, write a blog, participate in online clubs and communities, um, or you know, join XR Bootcamp. There's an abundance of resources out there um, that can kind of help you be, be successful in this field. Um, and a bit, of a bit of a shameless plug, but um, please take a look at our open positions and see if any of them you know, catch your eye junior and experienced developers from the game and film industries tend to be pretty successful here, I think, because their skills transfer over relatively seamlessly. Um, and if you wanna use those skills to, to help people, um, then please take a look at what we're doing and, and drop us a line. And um, that's just about everything that I had. Sorry if I rambled a little bit too quickly, but uh, thanks for your time and I'll, uh, I'll let uh, Matt take it from here. John, I'm just going to share my screen here. Hopefully everyone can see that okay. All right. Um, so, oh, let's go back up there. Um, John showed we have a quite a number of positions open right now, including uh, in our areas. Um, but I'm going to focus on what we look for in engineers as the, the CTO. That's kind of my area and talk a little bit more in depth about that. So what are we looking for um, when we're hiring software engineers also? Um, so solid fundamentals in engineering is always uh, something we're looking for. Um, and some of the important things there is that you should have like a good grasp of programming essentials, you know, understand data structures and algorithms. Um, we love to see some experience with games or XR development outside of games. Um, if you don't have that professional experience, then 
as been emphasized before, portfolio projects are the best way to kind of really showcase what you're capable of. Um, familiarity with all of the different areas that go into making XR experiences. Um, so performance optimization, some of the 3D math, that kind of thing is, is great to see. Um, and experience working on teams, um, solo projects are great, but we like even more to see that you've done projects in collaboration with other disciplines, artists, uh, designers, that kind of thing. Um, some of the things that are less important to us that might be sometimes more emphasized in other software engineering roles. Um, we don't particularly look for like a formal computer science education. I don't have a computer science degree. Um, I mean, it certainly doesn't hurt if you have one, we're not gonna see it, hold it against you, um, but it's not a requirement if you demonstrate that you've um, been a self learner and that you've you've learned some of this stuff on, on your own. Um, we don't particularly need to see big company experience if you've worked in small teams. Uh, we're, even though we're growing rapidly, we still consider ourselves a small team. And um, as long as you've got some experience working with others, it doesn't have to be from some uh, giant corporation. Um, we're not particularly focused on like your ability to solve whiteboard problems, like algorithm problems on the spot in interviews. Um, we don't think that that's how people work in their daily job. And uh, again, if you can do that, great, but it's not something that we're going to be evaluating people on typically. Um, and then the other thing that you might wonder about being that we're a surgical training company is, you know, I, I don't know anything about medicine. I really had no background in medicine coming into this. Um, it's again, if you have it great, but like we we're really looking for engineers who can help us build the products and we have other experts in the company who can give guidance on the medical side of things. Um, so some other things we look for outside of that. Um, there's a, a quote, I think it was originally from Joel on software that what they look for in engineers is smart and gets things done. So that's, I think, a pretty good summary of what we like to see. Um, uh, demonstrated ability to finish projects is part of that getting things done. Um, and that means like actually, you know, getting it to to ship, so to speak, even if it's a portfolio project. Um, I'd always prefer to see something that's kind of tightly scoped and, and small scale and just focuses on a few elements, but that is pretty much finished and relatively polished rather than some super ambitious, like, you know, VR MMO that you decided to build as a side project that isn't ever really finished and is, is kind of in a state of um, incompleteness. So tight scope is, is often good to see in these type of projects. Um, and then, you know, this is a classic engineering thing, the ability to take a, a problem that um, has been communicated to you, but might not be super well defined to really bring some definition to it and break it down into some concrete steps that you can see moving towards a solution. Um, and we're also looking for friendly collaborative team members. We have a very uh, kind of friendly team. Um, we're not looking for like the rock star programmer who kind of doesn't work play well with others. We, we really want people who are going to be able to help out um, the other disciplines on the team with challenges they run into with the tools and just generally be a uh, someone that everyone wants to come and spend the day working with. Um, things we don't require, again, which you might see in other places, uh, as John mentioned, we're very focused on kind of work-life balance. We have a lot of people who have a background in the games or tech industry uh, and are a little older with families. Um, they don't want to be doing uh, crunch, working eight hour weeks for weeks or months at a time. And we don't think that that's the best way to produce great work either. So we don't think it's sustainable. Um, so that's not something that we're expecting or looking for in people. Um, we're not looking for people who can dream up super elaborate, complex solutions to, to problems if there's a simpler alternative that would work. Uh, we kind of like pragmatic, solve the problem and, and move on because we have no end of problems to solve and they don't all need to be solved in uh, the most elaborate way possible. Uh, we don't need people to be willing to move across the country for a job or to a new city. We don't need people to accept living with a, a long commute in San Francisco traffic. Um, we've been a fully remote team from day one, um, which is obviously, you know, helps us navigate uh, a global pandemic a little easier than if we had a traditional office. Uh, but that's always been in our DNA. It's not something um, that was new for us and it's not something we plan to change as the world hopefully starts to return to normal. Um, and we don't expect, you know, you hear sometimes like, I think Amazon, there was recently stories about this, having very strict policies on you being able to do side projects, working on games, game jams outside of work. We are very happy for people to work on um, side projects as long as they're not like directly competing with our business. We, we encourage people to be working on, um, you know, expanding their, their skill set, working on game jams, and anything like that, we, we welcome. Um, so I'm gonna move into a little bit of kind of what I would say is fairly generalized for XR engineers. This is obviously from my perspective and not everyone will see it this way, but um, I'm trying not to make this just entirely tuned to OSSO. 
Um, I will talk about what specific technologies we use, but I'll mention other technologies as well. Um, so I think it's important for engineers to know one language well that's relevant to the area that they're working in. Um, typically, if you're going to be in XR, that's either C Sharp with Unity, or if you're working in Unreal or many other engines, it's going to be C++. Um, knowing multiple languages is great, but it's kind of similar to the Focus Portfolio project. We'd rather see someone who uh, knows one or a small number of languages really well and in depth than someone who can kind of say that they can dabble in a whole bunch of languages, but isn't really going to be uh, super effective in, in any one of them. Um, and obviously for us, we are a, a Unity uh, development studio, so C Sharp is, is the specific thing for us. Uh, but we would certainly look at a strong candidate who had Unreal C++ background, because um, if they've shown the ability to, to work with other tools, they can probably uh, learn the ropes with Unity as well. But Unity is our, our preferred uh, experience. Uh, and I think in general in XR, um, Unity has a bit of a a lead over Unreal in terms of popularity, particularly in probably Enterprise XR, but Unreal is a fine choice as well if you've, you've got to pick something to learn. Um, and then adding other languages once you've kind of mastered a primary one, I think it's always educational. You can learn a lot, but um, yeah, do focus on kind of knowing knowing a few things well rather than many things at a kind of low level. Um, similarly to languages, like it's good to know one engine well. Again, I'd rather see even for us, where we're a Unity shop, I'd rather uh, see someone who knows Unreal inside and out than someone who's dabbled in every engine out there. Um, experience with a range of engines and tools is great, but focus on learning one or two well, and then look at others for comparison. But um, really, depth of knowledge often is better than breadth of knowledge in these kind of things. Um, and yeah, there's plenty of things, to, other things to look at there that are interesting. You've got Godot in the open sport source space, but really uh, Unity and Unreal are the kind of main choices in the industry at the moment, I would say. Um, this is kind of coming from the other end. You want to go deep on particular areas, but it's also good to have at least at a kind of shallower level, a broad understanding of how things fit together in the space overall. Uh, so that means knowing about all the key areas of technology that um, are used in XR development, things like rendering, physics, audio input, you've got gameplay, asset management, pipelines, serialization, UI and UX, AI and pathfinding. It's good to be aware of how all of these things uh, come together at a high level to, to produce an XR experience. Um, and that gives you context when you're working on a project. You don't need to know everything in depth. That's probably not possible for anybody, but just understanding how the pieces fit together is, is valuable. Um, and then go deep on a few areas. So you know, typically within any company, you'll find like people who are the go-to guy on some particular topic or tool set. Um, so as you kind of get uh, familiar with the field overall, whichever areas jump out to you as particularly interesting that kind of appeal to you, um, pick a few and, and really go deep on them. Um, so there's some areas which I think tend to be more popular for this, things like rendering, um, AI, sometimes like networking multiplayer, it's common for people to, to focus on and that's great. But don't forget about some of the kind of less well-known areas because um, because they are perhaps less obvious choices. They can be some of the most valuable in terms of um, like your career. Uh, so kind of more niche areas, things like build systems and asset pipelines and interaction design, things that sometimes might be seen as more like plumbing infrastructure and not as exciting are super valuable in a, like a, a team that's um, doing production work. Build systems for us is a a never ending thing that we have to struggle with. So don't forget about that. Um, and then learning your tools is important as well for an engineer. So um, again, it's good to be familiar with a whole range of tools and, and their purposes, and then go deep on a few that, that you find yourself using and that are particularly relevant to your chosen areas of expertise. So that means things like IDEs and editors, debuggers, source control systems, profilers, build systems, diffing tools, art tools for 2D and 3D, um, and, you know, for, for us, that some of the tools that we, our engineers use a lot is things like Visual Studio or Rider, depending on the engineer's preference. Um, Git we use heavily, uh, Render Doc for profiling, um, GitHub Actions is our build system that we're in the process of moving over to at the moment. Um, there's free open source tools that you can use to learn the basics of like 3D and 2D art software, so like Blender, GIMP, and then there's the professional tools like Maya and Photoshop, which if you have access to them, um, are, are great to have a little bit of experience in as well. 
as an engineer, you don't need to be like a, an expert on these things, but just be familiar with um, the basics, what they do, how they how they fit into the process, and uh, understand how they can be extended as well is helpful. Um, so yeah, pick pick some that again appeal to your interests, areas uh, areas that you've chosen to become an expert on, and and try and go deep on them. And that's uh, definitely an asset when we're we're hiring to see someone who's really knows their stuff in a particular area that's valuable to us. Um, and that's kind of the overview. Um, so I think we're probably ready to move into questions at this point. That's Great. where I jump in, Fern. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think great overview. I, I mean, uh, Vangelis is already doing a good job of a little bit classifying the questions and preparing for you. Let me introduce Vangelis as well. He's, uh, he's a good friend of us for the last maybe five, six years. We are working together. He's from, uh, he's uh, well known uh, in uh, especially academics part as well and the industry part. Maybe he can give a little bit of intro um, since he's doing a very uh, interesting program at USC, University of Southern California. And we are working very closely to democratize VRER for the last five, six years. And on top of that, he is also helping us to close the skills gap. And he has also been part of many industry uh, organizations, initiatives, including MedVR and may, many other um, organizations as well. So we are really happy to have him today as a moderator. So Vangel, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining in. Thanks John and Matt for the excellent presentation and uh, Farhan for the Rachel and Bootcamp, Excel Bootcamp uh, team for the excellent work you're doing. Uh, yes, I'm a cross academic. Uh, I run a, a massive class uh, at USCVW School of Engineering and uh, computer science uh, class for XR. And the, there is obvious that there is a huge demand out there. Uh, and we, we try with every way we can uh, to facilitate uh, this uh, growing demand with uh, skillful engineers, artists, and uh, designers. Uh, one of the, the areas that uh, is growing uh, a lot in the, the past few years uh, is uh, medical XR, as we call it, and medical VR in specifically training uh is uh, one area that accelerates uh particularly faster because of the direct uh correlation between virtual reality and training when it comes to surgical training things are serious we have surgeons that operate on uh humans and it's a life and death uh situation and that reminds me of a, a game back in the 80s for those that they they leave this uh uh, era, um, uh, which actually called life and death, and uh, if you could play on your Amigas or uh, Amstrads and uh, home computers at that time. So but even back from the 80s, there was a correlation between gaming and, and surgical training. Now, when we're talking about virtual reality, we're talking about the master uh, medium to get you immersed and situated in a, uh, in a condition where you have to operate with other members in your surgical team. And uh, um, it's, a, it's a truly serious game to play. Uh, we're here today to explore this correlation between the, the gaming and the virtual reality training with emphasis in uh, medical training and surgical training with our partner, also VR. And uh, we started well given the, the overview I'm getting some uh, specific uh, questions uh, here. Uh, one of them, and will be great to start from uh, there, uh, relates to uh, technical artists, uh, 3D modelers, animators, that they have general skills that they acquired. And now we're talking about the medical context. What do they need to know and how to transfer the skills into um, uh, surgical training and medical training in VR in general? Please, either John or Matt. Uh, I can take a stab first and then and maybe let, let John jump in. Um, so we have a kind of split on our team. Um, we have a, a pretty big contingent of uh, people who trained as medical illustrators. So those are artists who also have a background in anatomy and the medical side of things. And they're really the sort of core of our team in terms of they, they drive the production of um, the, the training content. 
Uh, but we also have a, a selection of traditional kind of 3D artists and, and other kind of uh, backgrounds from game and film industry um, who don't have necessarily that same kind of depth of like medical understanding, but they support the, the rest of the team in making um, lots of models, doing CAD conversion. Um, some of those guys, even though they don't have any kind of formal training from a medical background are like experts in anatomy. Um, often you find that artists who've done kind of organic modeling become very interested in anatomy. And uh, we have some some guys on the art team who even though they don't have any kind of formal background in that stuff are like really amazing experts and produce amazing art pieces. Um, so certainly we do have a focus on kind of uh, the type of art that we're creating, which is a lot of like hard surface modeling of kind of tools and equipment, the kind of things you see in an operating room, but also a lot of uh, anatomy and typically it's different artists who kind of specialize in those two areas. Um, we're definitely looking to expand our kind of animation expertise. Um, and then we're also looking into kind of technical artists uh, with like a gaming background to help solve some of the pipeline issues and just help some of those artists figure out how to do new things that we need for new pieces of content. Um, and for those, like if you've worked in kind of non-medical backgrounds, gaming, movies, and you really have a deep understanding of the tools and what's possible and how to get good performance, that kind of thing, um, I think we'd, we've got plenty of use for those skills, even if you don't have the kind of medical uh, experience. As long as you're prepared to occasionally have to watch gruesome surgical videos, that is kind of a little bit of a requirement at work. We have to have people who are, who are going to be comfortable watching the occasional video of a, of a surgery, which I had a bit of trouble with to start with. But. <laughs> uh, John, do you have something to add? Um, yeah, I mean, Matt covered pretty much, you know, all of it, but uh, I think, yeah, an understanding of, of um, you know, our pipelines is, is important and especially for both our artists and animators, I think a, a really um, deep knowledge of, of human and maybe even animal anatomy and, uh, and deformation is, is pretty crucial, I think, to uh, being um, successful and and yeah, with that comes um, comes the occasional graphical uh, graphic surgical video. But um, but folks who are yeah kind of I think fascinated and really interested in, in human anatomy and kind of know it inside out um, are uh, are probably going to be pretty successful here. That's a great point. It reminds me of uh, Leonardo da Vinci that was a master in anatomy in order to be able to draw successfully uh, by his subjects. Um, he did amazing work illustrating. Uh, anatomy back then, great. Um, how about, to follow up, how about game designers? Uh, which is more about the interaction design, we can touch uh, uh, UI UX um, uh, after that, but if we take the niche of a game designer, focusing on the gamification, the, um, the interactions, the game mechanics, uh, let's call it, within your application in surgical training, is there room for game designers? I think there definitely is a place for that skill set, um, but of, of all the various disciplines who might come from gaming, it's probably a little bit more of a shift in mindset for someone uh, from mm -hmm. game design, because the classic thing for game design is like, it's all about fun, right? And finding the fun. And that's that's really what you're uh, trying to get to with, um, with really very few constraints beyond what's technically possible. Uh, whereas we have a kind of more constraints in terms of like, we have to represent things accurately. Uh, we can't just come up with a, a fun drilling mechanic if it doesn't match the way that drills are actually used in like an orthopedic surgical setting. So there are in some ways um, more constraints, but you know, it's, it's often said that constraints drive creativity, right? So like the, I, I think there is still plenty of room for creativity and yeah, interaction design, UX design, even things that are kind of, you know, fairly common to any VR experience of like how should teleporting work um, is stuff that certainly there's a place for game designers and kind of UX UI designers to help us figure out how best to implement that. Uh, one of the things for us that's maybe a bit different is that um, many of our users are still like VR um, newbies, VR illiterate. They're not necessarily coming from a gaming background. You know, surgeons are very smart, highly skilled people, but they're not necessarily um, super technical or have much time to play games, that kind of thing. So we do have to really put a, a big emphasis on like usability and ease of use and ease of discoverability, understanding for VR experiences, we can't necessarily assume that someone spent hours playing Half-Life Alex and, and knows all of the kind of conventions of, of VR uh, design. So that's something, but yeah, we, we certainly have a place for, for people with that background. They just are operating under a different set of constraints than they might be used to coming from the games industry. 
Perfect. And I think uh, it's about uh, shifting your mindset more into skills acquisition, you know, from the game mechanics, how you acquire the skills, and then, you know, try to fit from that angle into surgical training. Perfect. Let's try it, dive a little bit more in UI UX. User interfaces, user experiences at the core of virtual reality as a medium that is experiential and immersive. Um, uh, how you address uh, your needs uh, in good UX for virtual reality uh, training and uh, UI. Thank you, Sean. This one first, John. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that UX and UI design is um, is definitely a really interesting and um, uh, space. Like when it comes to to VR, you know. Um, have, making sure that people actually kind of understand how to do what they're trying to do and getting, getting the guidance from good, simple uh, design that's uh, almost intuitive, you know, without having a bunch of things popping up and flashing on your screen, um, kind of pointing you in certain directions. Um, I, I think that, uh, that there's, that, yeah, that there's a huge, huge and important need for, um, for talented UX and, and UI designers in the space. And yeah, one of the things that we're still kind of refining and working on improving um, in the context of our training is how to convey like fairly complex information that it's important to convey accurately again, because, you know, this is like surgical stuff. We don't want to mislead people about anything. We've got to give the information accurately, um, but it can be quite complicated and you don't want just a giant floating textbook in, in VR. That's not really a, a great way to convey information. But being able to convey relevant points about particular aspects of, a, of the surgery um, in context at the moment that someone is um, dealing with that part of the procedure is something that we are still kind of iterating on and trying to figure out the best way. And there's like, I think a lot of scope there for UI UX designers to really rethink how do you present complex information in like a 3D spatial context? Um, because unfortunately, the sort of easy and perhaps lazy solution is to just pop up an info screen 2d info panel and at the moment we we find ourselves relying on that more than we'd like and, and we're really trying to explore uh, different approaches that take full advantage of like the 3d nature of, of vr excellent thank you so much um let's uh, take a, a, a both side view uh here in our follow an excellent question uh that says uh, what are the details about the steps of a cycle that also VR follows while designing uh, a new training uh, scenario, a new uh, VR simulation? So can you describe step by step how you go from um, a business directive into design specifications, into developing you know, the procedure and integrating with the system that you have in place at also VR? So yeah, we have, uh, and this is something that we've sort of been iterating on over time, and it's always something that we, we feel there's room to improve, but kind of where we're at right now, I would say, um, once we've initially engaged with the customer and we've kind of established, okay, here's a particular surgical technique that they'd like to produce some VR training for, um, we will uh, get our medical illustrators, uh, who, our med tech team, we, we call them. Um, one of them will be a project lead for a particular training project. And one of the first things that they'll do is really dive into all of the available reference materials, watching videos, reading uh, like technique guides. They're often called, it's like a PDF of, uh, you know, all the instructions, the, the sequence of steps that you have to take. Um, and then they'll have discovery calls, we call them with the client, where they'll work, walk through what they've understood so far and ask questions about like how exactly um, should parts of this be presented and really try and understand like, what is what is this like that we're trying to convey here? What are your key educational objectives? Um, what are you hoping people will come away really understanding at the end of this? What do you want to emphasize? Uh, and from there, they start to break down um, the the surgical technique into uh, a series of steps that leverage like our in-house interaction library. So we have a library of kind of reusable interactions for things like drilling, sawing, operating a C arm, which is a, a like a big X-ray machine. Um, uh, screwing objects together, attaching one object to another, manipulating a limb, uh, all these different interactions that, that we have, they'll start to break down the training into, into the sequence there. And this at the moment is still living in kind of online tools. Um, we're, we're not yet in Unity. 
Um, they'll review that with the client again, kind of early in the process and kind of just make sure that everything's in the right order and we're covering all of the essential elements. And at that point, also the art team is going to start gathering all of the art reference. So where possible, we'll get CAD models for the, um, for the equipment that where they have them available. Uh, we'll figure out what anatomy might need to be modeled and whether we already have that from the anatomy library that we're building up over time or whether it's something new that needs to be modeled, new types of incisions that need to be modeled. Uh, so building out the list of all of the, the artwork that's going to need to be get, getting done to complete the project. Um, and that's the point where kind of in parallel, the art team will start working on those assets and the med tech team will start pulling that together into Unity. Um, that's also the point early on in the process where we're establishing if there's anything new from an engineering point of view. So, um, you know, best case scenario, it's kind of, we're able to build it using uh, existing interactions from our existing library and there's not new engineering work required, but often we'll have some new element. We have to figure out how we're gonna implement this from, a, from an interaction point of view and get that scheduled for the engineers to work on. Um, and then over the process of developing the project, which can you know be anything from three months to a year, depending on the complexity of the, um, the project, uh, we'll have what we call WIP reviews, work in progress reviews with the client, where we show them uh, like progress towards the finished training, often with like uh, untextured placeholder assets and, and that kind of thing, but just to make sure um, you know, as we work with clients over time, they get more familiar with what XR does, but certainly for our new clients, um, this is all kind of new to them. And so the best way for them to understand what we're building is for us to show them like frequent check-ins along the way as we build that out. And then we take that through until we've all got final assets. And the very last part of the process is usually kind of sign off from the legal teams within the, uh, the, the customers' companies to make sure that we're accurately conveying all the information that, we're, that everything kind of meets their um, legal checklists of like what we, uh, we're conveying things correctly and not saying anything that we we shouldn't be saying that kind of thing um so that's kind of high level overview of the end-to-end -end process it's uh there's it's, it. it's many mm -hmm. steps along the way and many people involved exactly that's uh obvious that there are many people involved how about a uh, user research how you measure engagement effectiveness uh transferability of skills where we dive more you know on uh, the evaluation of your uh training do you do that in-house uh, so I guess there's there's a few different tracks there. Like we have um, analytics built into the product so we can see uh, how often it's being used, um, how, how long it takes people to complete a technique uh, when they're in what we call test mode, which is where they're not being given prompts. So this is after they've hopefully learned the steps of the technique and we're now seeing if they remember them. We can see how often they got stuck, how often they had to ask for help. This is all information that's collected and, and surfaced to the, the customers so that they can use it as part of their training programs and for their own internal um, kind of understanding of, of usage and, and effectiveness. Um, kind of in parallel as a, a somewhat separate thing, we're working with various like medical schools, educational institutions to do proper scientific studies of the effectiveness of the training, um, kind of, you know, actually evaluating are people learning effectively from this. And we have uh, some of that research has actually already been published. Um, I don't have to hand the information, but I think probably on our website, you could find links to some of these and, and it has shown like very high levels of effectiveness. Actually, we've been pleasantly surprised by just how, how much um, we see the improvement in, in users, both in terms of the time for them to complete uh, something and in terms of how often they, they need prompting when they're learning a new technique versus traditional methods of, of learning. And one of the things that isn't immediately obvious, but we've, we've started to see in practice and reports from surgeons in the field is bringing the time end to end time for completing a, a procedure down. And that's correlates very strongly with patient outcomes. The less time that a patient spends on the table and under anesthetic, the more likely they are to have a good medical outcome. So there's actually huge value in getting that, um, end to end time down. And, and we, so we're very happy to see that that is actually showing up in, uh, in some of our results that we're shortening the time for the procedure to be completed as well as reducing errors and absolutely confusion. and probably human factors and um uh, play a significant role ergonomics you know there are a lot of correlations between the actions that the surgeon uh, takes and uh his team in order to, to reduce uh that time how about rapid prototyping how important it is do you have r d uh, what is happening with the uh, um, the rapid uh, uh, cycles of uh, testing and innovation? Um, so 
I think the way that we like to approach kind of a new, a new problem, a new type of interaction that we have to solve is to try and get something up and running in VR as quickly as possible and just get feedback on it from the team and from the customer. Um, so yeah, it, it's a sort of form of focused rapid prototyping where we want to, we want to like, um, reduce the uncertainty when we have a kind of uh, a new type of problem. And there's often a lot of unanswered questions, like, are we going to be able to do this with sufficient performance to run on quest? Is it going to, um, be confusing? Is it going to be easy for people to understand? Is it all these things? And the best way to get to an answer on those is to try and get like an MVP, as we, we call it internally built out and, and tested quickly, because, um, it's, it's hard to, to guess that kind of stuff until you actually get it running in VR. So that's kind of a big part of the process for sure. Yeah. One one question, or among all the things that you mentioned, Matt, uh, how you see the similarities uh, between a game production pipeline and even the beta testing and QA process, uh, or MVP, even uh, the level of MVP that we are talking about, uh, like game versus the enterprise. So how does it differ from each other or have similarities? So a person who is already having an experience on game production pipeline, should we expect this, uh, like they will have a, a much more comfortable um, career path or understanding the uh, the projects in enterprise? Um, I think it's similar to what I, I said about game designers, where many of the skills are transferable, much of the technology is very similar, but the constraints are a little different. So it's not all about like finding the fun and you can't just decide that, you know, this, this drilling mechanic isn't fun. So I'm going to throw it out and do something different you, because your your choice of what to do has to match reality at least um close enough that that it, it's not detracting from the educational value of the experience so mm -hmm. um it's it's similar many of the same skills and like knowledge base come into play it's just you're operating with a kind of a slightly unfamiliar set of constraints and with a different end goal that you're optimizing for you're optimizing ultimately for like educational value and not for fun so um mm -hmm. fun helps people learn and it's one of the things that you know i think has been proven in, over time is that people are enjoying the learning experience they're more likely to retain the information but at the same time you can't like just make something fun and throw out the educational piece that's that's really at the end of the day we're trying to uh, teach people something and, and make the make them more effective and ultimately in, improve patient outcomes and that's that's really the thing that you're driving towards now if john's got anything to add on that from his gaming background and what he's observed um, no, I mean, that's, I think you pretty much <clears throat> covered it, but uh, yeah, it's, um, there, there are differences similar to what I should have mentioned during, you know, the animation portion, um, you know, the medical animation is probably not going to be um, as, you know, wild as doing some big cinematic cutscene in, in games or film, um, but, uh, but it's, it's important. And if you're bought in on, on the mission, then I think that transferring the skills from, from games over to the work that we're doing is um, is relative. Well, I don't want to use the word seamless, but pretty close to it, I think. And, I think uh, something that, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say a difference that I think people would probably find is that um, we go like much deeper on the real details of a particular thing than you typically would in games, right? Like in games, yeah. you fire a rocket launcher and somebody blows up into pieces and and someone pays attention to it for a couple of seconds and think that's cool, but nobody's looking that the anatomy is accurate or like at real details. When we have a, an incision and the focus is on like, you know, uh, we've got some procedures where you're um, cauterizing like the heart. And so like you're doing very precise kind of uh, cauterization of where you can't make a mistake, the kind of level of detail that it goes into that exceeds anything you would typically see in a game. But we don't have the sort of broad range of like you know like an open world game does everything sort of at a very coarse level <laughs> we we tend to do a very small number of things at a like super mm -hmm. deep and super realistic level so that's that's kind of a change that people would probably notice coming from a game's background yeah both on the art and, side and on the and, engineering side and rather and quality matters a lot i mean I, i'm uh very impressed with the with the um, i think your journey from the early um, stages of um, uh, of also to right now that you really mature, you have a, a great team in house, and the rendering quality is getting to you know a really uh, great level. So 
how do you uh, work with uh, shaders? How do you work with your rendering pipelines? Do you develop your uh, your own? Uh, how important is that, that skill set into your team? And it, it's it's certainly very important, yeah. And um, you know, we've done something which I, I I questioned for myself whether it was possible when we were first embarking on it, which was we were shifting over from PC high end gaming laptops to Quest, and at the same time we're trying to up the quality level of our rendering. And it's like, well, we got much less performance to work with, and we also need to, or we would like to make things look better. And I think at this point we have actually managed to pull that off, and that's a combination of a bunch of very talented artists, but also some real like a uh, rendering wizardry on our engineering team. One of our engineers in particular, Geo, is like a, a shader wizard and um, spends mm -hmm. a lot of time. Uh, we've got fairly heavily customized uh, slash rewritten from scratch versions of some of the Unity shaders that really emphasize the features that we need to show anatomy effectively um, and to make it look realistic. And you know, I think, again, like I said, some of the videos that, that are now publicly available of our more recent work, I think, showcase that. Like we've, We feel like we're, we're in a pretty good place. But definitely people really respond to um, realism, both in terms of just the kind of aesthetics of the experience, which makes it more pleasurable to people to use, but it actually matters as well if you can show um, the details of like what people would expect to see in, mm -hmm. in the real OR. It all helps for the training to stick. The closer we can be to kind of reality, the less people get taken out of the experience, you know, that kind of presence factor that people talk about in XR, you don't get kind of taken out of the experience because things look fake and, and kind of uncanny valley-ish, um, but also you can see the details that really matter mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. knowing what to look for when you're doing the real thing, so. And we're talking about surgical training, surgical teams, uh, the multiple users across the globe that might join a, a, a training session. So how you are developing your platform? Uh, what's the, the place there for engineers that are looking in uh, networking, you know, measure analytics, that means a strong back end uh, or dashboards, uh, user accounts, how much of the traditional uh, backend and platform engineering do you accommodate? Um, so I've I've been focused on the XR side of, en of engineering because it's kind of you know XR bootcamp. Uh, but I, I shouldn't neglect to mention that we also have like a, a couple of really good engineers on what we call our platform team who come from more of a traditional web uh, background and are doing yeah the analytics, uh, a lot of our distribution platform, um, user management, all that kind of thing. So they uh, very much a core part of the product and yeah they they work on um things in a much more kind of traditional like web centric approach um they dabble in unity from time to time as well we have a, a vr launcher that runs on quest that they they are largely responsible for but um essentially yeah if, if you think it sounds like an interesting space to work in but but you're really coming from a, a web background and um that's where you want to stay for sure we'd be we'd love to hear from you because we definitely have open open positions in that space i just Kind of neglected to mention it here because of the XR focus, but um, and then uh, I think the other part of your question was, sorry, I think there was a two-part question. I've forgotten the other part. Um, um, I think it was more about oh, the, the back end mu multiplayer, right? Collaborative. Uh, oh yes. So <laughs> we have we have something we call collaborative training, um, and that is mostly uh, handled on the the XR engineering team, and it's certainly like an increasingly important part of of what we're doing with the product. Um, we you know, we were kind of showing off that at a large scale for the first time at a big medical conference last week, but it's something that we, we've been rolling out over the last year. And yeah, it's we think it's a huge part of the product going forward, the ability um, to bring people together remotely into a virtual OR and have expert surgeons training uh, new people and answering questions in that setting um, is, is certainly, we think, super impactful. Um, and the interest in it from our customers has obviously like increased significantly during COVID because they were not able to travel and do in-person sales and training the way that they had in the past. And so that's been a huge, um, huge thing for us over the last little while and continues to be. So yeah, certainly anyone with experience in, in multiplayer games, a lot of that transfers over and it's um, a super important part of the product for us. Before we, we jump uh, to talk more about um, uh, recruitment and how it is to, to work for uh, also, uh, do you have plans to also integrate uh, with um, uh, mixed reality uh, AR 
uh, headsets like the HoloLens or Magic Leap or any of these. Um, uh, so we're we're certainly yes. keeping an eye on on the technology and the developments in that space. Um, it's not our focus at the moment, and a couple of reasons for that. One is that our feeling is that the technology is not as mature yet, but VR we think really is at the sweet spot where the maturity, the like consumer ready nature of like a Quest 2 headset, uh, the pricing, all that kind of thing makes it very, very much uh, ready for prime time. And we're, we're seeing rollouts of thousands of headsets with our biggest customers. And, and we just think that uh, VR is ready for that. The other thing is that our focus has been on training and the traditional training that we're kind of supplementing and to some extent replacing. Um, involves shipping these huge heavy crates of like instruments around the country big sharp heavy dangerous <laughs> equipment that people are then using in like hotel conference rooms to to train um we're by putting everything virtual we're eliminating a lot of the like logistical complexity around that um ar is super interesting people have the idea that you put on the ar headset in the uh, operating room and it would give you guidance um but that's kind of not the space we're in right now and in in the space we're in the training we're trying to do the fact that there are no physical objects required is is actually a huge asset so it's it's mm -hmm. less interesting for what we're doing right now um if you do get into the like giving people some ar overlay over the um over a, an actual or um obviously there's huge potential there but also it comes with a huge amount of like regulatory complexity around it if you're actively telling a surgeon where to make an incision on a live patient that's a whole different kind of level of uh you know, risk complexity and like mm -hmm. you have to be, there's no room for error in, in that kind of thing where our training, obviously you want to convey accurate information, but there's, there's no actual patients on the line during the training. So AR comes with its own set of complexity. I think it will be that vision of the future will come one day, but it's, it's not where we're focused right now, Perfect. but we're keeping what an eye on it and seeing how it goes. What about controllers versus advanced uh, VR interactions uh, with, with hands, you know, natural interactions? Uh, a lot of um, uh, surgeons might work with uh, um, robotic uh, surgical um, controllers, but, you know, hands are uh, in the dexterity and the muscle memory of, uh, of, the, of the, the hand movement is uh, um, extremely crucial. Do you uh, work with both? Do you try to transition from controllers into natural hand interactions? So it's again, it's something we're actively keeping an eye on and probably see as like a, maybe a nearer term thing. I actually did the XR Bootcamp advanced hand interaction class with um, the guys from the uh, hand physics lab, um, mm -hmm. which was excellent and like I learned a lot there. Um, but the, um, the tra hand tracking on the Quest 2 at the moment we feel is not quite robust and reliable enough for the kind of precision that we're looking for relative to the controllers. Um, there's still some jittering, some problems with like hand occlusion. Those will be solved over time, but right now we don't feel it's it's quite where we need it to be. Um, the other thing, which is kind of a little, not an obvious, I guess, but particularly for us working in orthopedics is that a large part of the surgery is often like holding a drill or a saw and operating it with a trigger. And so the controller is actually a very natural fit for that. And the haptics that you get for the controller is actually like perfect for that kind of thing. Um, so controllers are actually in some ways better than hands because you're actually physically holding an object that is at least similar to the to the equipment that you're supposed to be using. Um, for other parts of the surgery where you where you would be using your hands kind of freehand, uh, hand tracking is certainly interesting, but then you go kind of switch back and forth. So right now, controllers is still kind of where we're focused, but we're yeah definitely keeping a close eye on developments in, in hand tracking and kind of figuring out where it fits in our um, in our plans going forward, probably using the the um, uh, the pass through of the of the uh, the cameras and uh, OpenCV, you'll be able to combine both at some point, especially with the yeah. the quest or the advances that we see um, in hand tracking and object recognition. May you allow allow you to when you grab a um, a tool to use the the controller and then your hands and naturally blend the the two, right? Yeah. There's definitely like interesting stuff coming down the pipe. And, and again, we, it's always tricky as a startup, right? You've got to like try and find a sweet spot of where the technology is like ready for prime time. And we, we certainly are forward looking and we're keeping an eye on things, but we can't afford to be too much in the like R and D space. We, we try and keep ourselves to what we feel works really well, like today, uh, technology wise, and then watch for new technologies coming down the pipe that as they, as they cross that threshold.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's uh, focus more now uh, in your area, John. Uh, there is uh, a lot of um, uh, new values and new um, uh, soft skills acquired needed to operate in the in the medical uh, field. Um, what can you tell us about the soft skills, the passion and impact, mission and vision that uh, someone needs to to have to effectively join uh, a um, a team like uh, also we are. Yeah, I think um, you know I think it really helps to obviously be be kind of bought in on the mission and uh, and to be bought in on on that mission you kind of have to care about um, care about people and um, care about helping them. And I think that um, just about everyone who I've met at the company um, seems to almost have their own personal story that that brought them here. Um, and it can be, you know, someone who's very junior or someone who, who's much more experienced and uh, later on in their in their career. But um, but I think that uh, it, it's much easier and maybe almost you know crucial to be successful in this field to to really you know care about about people and and try to want to I guess to want to actually help them. And uh, I think that that's one of the the biggest things. If you don't really, you know, believe in the mission, and uh, and you find you know the the work might um, I don't know end up becoming tedious or boring to you, and you're going to end up moving on to something that's you know kind of flashy and the, you know the next zombie killing game or whatever it might be. But I think um, I think the people that kind of see the bigger picture um, are going to be pretty successful and pretty bought in. I think that the pandemic in its own weird way kind of helped with that and kind of changed people's perspectives on on what really matters the most. Absolutely. And how you will describe the the culture in the in the company? How do you work? You mentioned that every everyone is remote. Um, how you uh, kind of align everyone and develop a culture for the co company uh, being uh, remote? Yeah, you know, um, Matt and the the folks who were who were there before me certainly um, were the ones that laid the groundwork for it. I had my own, you know, questions and kind of uh, light concerns about it before I joined. About like, wow, this company has been remote the whole time. How can you build a culture that way? But um, it starts, I think, with with leadership on down, from uh, you know just being you know friendly and, and welcoming and caring and kind and empathetic. Uh, these are all things that, that were very obvious to me even from my first day uh, even though it was you know a lot of faces on on a zoom screen um, i really felt uh, very welcomed and um, kind of part of the part of the group already um, so i think that uh, you know some some kindness and caring goes a long way i know that sounds very corny to some people but uh, but it's i think pretty critical uh, at a company with a mission like ours mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah i would just say like uh my co-founder, our CEO, Justin, like he, he's a big part of like driving that culture from the top down, right? Like you, you can't have a culture in a company if, if the leadership is not like naturally that way and bought into that. And, you know, he's, he's got a bunch of sayings, but like family first is something that we've always had. Like anytime anyone needs to do something during a work day, doesn't matter what deadlines we have coming up. Justin's always like, you know, take the time you need family first. That those kind of attitudes come down from leadership. And the feeling that leadership really values the well-being of the employees and isn't just like, you know, trying to get the maximum productivity out of them until they burn out and <laughs> kind of get washed up. You can't sort of fake that, right? And and that's that really comes down from I think the whole of the leadership team and the leadership team that we select as we bring new people in has to match that those values. And I think that is reflected in in the company overall. At least that's my feeling. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Justin is uh, also talking next week at MedVR event. I just shared the link for those who wants to see from this point of view as well. Of course, uh, our uh, talk is a little bit more technical and recruitment uh, and uh, careers related. Uh, but uh, if you are interested on the MedTech field, it might be also interesting. I just shared the link with everyone so you can register there. Um, MedVR event. So, um, Bangladesh, if you uh, if you you are okay with that, we can maybe take questions from our roundtable. I invited I have one last question for okay. uh, for John. 
Uh, John, if I I don't have previous uh, experience either in a, a, um, a medical uh, related field or in XR, uh, how can I find my way? And um, um, let's say that I, I have the passion, I have the interest, I'm sold on the mission and the vision, but what does it take for someone to prove that they they are dedicated and they want to get a career in uh, in the field you represent right now? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you're an artist just working on that portfolio, even if you don't have any professional experience um, building out, you know, an, an impressive portfolio, even for a junior artist is is crucial. Um, if you're an, an engineer, I think, you know, just you know, building some stuff on, on the side, maybe with, with friends or on your own, having having projects that, you know, may or may not relate even directly, uh, even if you just, you know, kind of built out your own um, little multiplayer experience or multiplayer game in VR um, could could definitely translate into, uh, you know, surgical training. Surgery in the OR is a multiplayer experience and just uh, kind of keeping at it uh, and being, you know, kind of carrying that, that passion that you have for your craft uh, into it, uh, I think, we, you know, we hire junior people all the time. I just hired a junior artist without a single day of professional experience a few weeks ago. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely possible. So I'd say just, um, just keep at it and stay active in the, in the communities and, uh, and, you know, make sure that you're, um, you know, kind of staying on top of also that maybe the news in the field, uh, even if it isn't medical XR specifically, you know, just understanding what the latest and greatest developments in VR are, I think that uh, that can be really important. And, uh, and coming back to also just, you know, being a good person. <laughs> I think that, that that really helps a lot too and goes a long way. Excellent. I, I would so just much. add that, that we have roles for, you know, not XR related, right? We, we have, uh, we're growing out an HR team, we have like a finance department, we have, so if people like want to believe in the mission want to like be part of that um there are roles for people who have no background and are not necessarily ready to jump into that and then also we have things like the um the platform team for software engineers coming from a web background and several of those engineers have expressed experience in like on the job getting to dabble in that in the xr side of things learning from the xr engineers and occasionally taking on tasks and kind of building up in that space so there there are parts even within our company for people who have no experience in this space, but but want to be part of the the team. Um, I feel like we right. should mention those people because they're they're just as important part of the business as everybody else, right? So absolutely, yeah. Our customer experience team is growing right now, and we're you know largely looking for folks who have you know QA experience just in in you know in games, not necessarily in VR. Um, so CX is a is a great way. CX and QA is a, a great way in. Um, and not to plug us too hard, but yeah, we have a lot of openings there and, um, we've had medical illustrators who've made the jump into the 3d art realm and are doing very well there. Uh, actually there is a question from a project management perspective. Stephanie wrote, uh, her question, but I told her actually to ask, uh, here directly to you guys. Uh, she was actually part of the, one of the hackathons that we organized and her team won the, uh, first prize on a VR, VR experience focusing on a sign language using hand tracking. So maybe uh, would like to ask Stephanie, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much, Johan, and thanks a lot um, everyone for organizing the event. Um, yeah, so I have a question. Um, I would love to have any recommendation for XR project manager find contracts in XR because um, I'm facing uh, issues as companies are often looked for developers or 3D artists, freelancers, but not for project manager. And uh, the team are often, often small or too small and uh, they have low budget issue. Um, I have experience in IT, computer science, uh, in project management, including the VFX project management. Uh, I also have a 3D background um, when I was at university, but uh, I'm facing this issue that they are mainly focused on developers or internship or 3D asset um, profile. Do you have um, any comments or recommendations, maybe? Um, we actually will be uh, posting a couple of new program manager jobs uh, very soon. One will be 
will be kind of art focused. It'll, there'll, it'll be a program manager or producer supporting the art team, but we'll, we'll also be posting one um, that will be a little bit more, you know, operations based. I, I think we currently have a posting for a, a producer for the, uh, for the marketing team. So, um, so yeah, the, these are, these are roles that are definitely very important to us. And I think we'll be um, growing that side of the organization more and more uh, as time goes on. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, and I, is it I think a lot of or maybe more uh, permanent position. We, oh, we tend uh, to prefer uh, to hire people full time. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Uh, okay. Um, but I would just say that I think a lot of uh, this is probably a reflection of the fact that XR is still a relatively young space, and a lot of the companies in the space are pretty small startups with you know, kind of limited budgets, uh, and so they have to focus on getting the you know, the, the software at the door. Um, as we're growing, we, we definitely are finding that we increasingly see the need for more organized project management and full-time people to be in charge of that. So I think it's it's partly just a, a question of the maturity of the industry. And as you see some companies kind of break out into the next level of, uh, of kind of growth, like we seem to be doing, um, there will probably be more of those opportunities come up, I would, I would guess. Um, Perfect. So maybe uh, Ryan, since he's also headhunting every day for different game companies and enterprise. Uh, is there any uh, like pathway or uh, like recommendation that you have, Ryan, for Stephanie? Um, I would say, uh, as Matt just said, the industry is still relatively young, even though it's been around over a decade now, or coming up to just around a decade. It's still quite young and the companies maybe haven't got to those positions yet. So I would say just keep applying for stuff, keep learning. Um, and there's always something out there. There is always a perfect role for everyone out there. Um, and I think the skill set you bring will become more and more in use. Um, and VR, uh, XR can be applied to so many different sectors from um, things like airplane, teaching people how to pilot planes to uh, i mentioned just before oil rig um training to what these guys are doing as well so the, as more sectors open up and it moves into more industries um there'll definitely be more opportunities to transition um or look at companies that do something similar to what you know already and what you do already but also have an xr department that you could maybe move into once you're in the company and already there and working with them Perfect. So uh, I just have... wanted to clarify yeah. one thing when I said we mostly look for full time people. What I mean by that is we're looking for people who want to be with us for like a while. They're like they, they, they see us being with us for you know years like we have a very low turnover rate. And that's something that I think has been to our benefit. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be like five days a week. We, we certainly have people on the team who are not five days a week. Um, it's, so there, there are opportunities for people to have more flexible working arrangements we're just not looking for someone to come in for like a three or a six month contract and then move on we, we want people who are going to be joining the team kind of long term so just wanted to make that distinction yeah perfect so we have around 10 minutes Vangelis uh, should we mm -hmm. go over the uh, I uh, so listed some uh, questions at the technical side how you render uh, faces and digital humans uh, how important is the facial expressions Um, so yeah, I mean, we don't focus a lot on faces because most of our surgeries, the patient is like unconscious and under, under a sheet. We do try and have like a convincing looking face, but we're not doing a lot of facial animation or anything like that currently. But you, um, you have but multiple, um, players, agents in the, we do, in, the world, uh, right? we, in our collaborative training, we have multiple users. Um, those avatars are relatively, um, simple, like simple abstract because you know there's there's a whole set of topics around this in xr but um you can go the the kind of uh, vr chat route of having like whatever avatar you want crazy avatars that look nothing like the the actual people but i think um for kind of more like enterprisey type vr applications it can be a bit disturbing for people to have an avatar that is nothing like mm -hmm. the actual person so we kind of keep them pretty abstract and also for, for performance on quest um, so again, facial animation is not a focus there. It's something that comes up from time to time and we will likely revisit in future as the technology and time allows. But um, at the moment, like facial animation specifically is not something 
we've had a focus on um, but you know, that could change especially as we branch out into other areas of surgery outside of orthopedics we may have mm -hmm. conscious patients from time to time so all right um let's see um what about uh, rendering pipelines? But let me uh, extend to that to um, uh, cloud rendering, remote rendering. There are a lot of mm -hmm. innovations happening at the moment with edge computes and uh, offering rendering on the cloud, the streaming rendering. Um, are you embracing these? Are you objecting so these? I would say like some of the other stuff we mentioned it's something we're keeping a, a close eye on and trying to see at what point is that technology ready for prime time uh, one of the challenges we face is that uh, a common use case for our training is in like a, a training session in a conference room or, or at a large conference where there can be flaky wi-fi not very robust cell connections mm -hmm. that kind of thing so we we still um make sure that all of our training works fully offline without an internet connection um, obviously that that doesn't fly for like a, a cloud streaming type of solution so that's one factor that we have to kind of bear in mind but there are certain contexts where i think it makes sense and it's really just again we're keeping an eye on technology and trying to evaluate when it's kind of ready for prime time and then where it, it's most applicable for our use case so we're not doing it today but we keep a close eye on it okay if i have a senior role a leading role at the at the game company at a studio and I want to apply it to your company. Do I do these uh, seniorities and levels play one to one? Um, how do you uh, address previous experience in seniority? So my my experience in the games industry, and, and John maybe has some input on this as well, is that it's not super consistent across game studios. Like what the roles are, you can't really just say you know an SE three is in EA is is not obviously mapped to a particular grade in in every other game studio. Um, certainly we are hiring senior. We, we recently hired a senior engineering manager who's kind of our first full-time engineering manager who, um, yeah, comes from that kind of senior level. Uh, so that, uh, and we, we, um, are interested in senior engineers with a lot of experience, particularly, um, engineers who are kind of individual contributors and want to remain as like domain experts, um, separate from kind of a management track. So we definitely as we grow, have, have scope to bring those roles in. In terms of like a mapping from one-to-one, -one, it, it, it's kind of, I, I don't think there is a very consistent one from what I've seen, but maybe John's got some input on that, I don't know. So, yeah, no, I, I agree. It kind of can, it can vary pretty wildly um, from studio to studio. And um, I think I, I mentioned when I met with you guys yesterday that, you know, when I was working at, at Oculus, there were some folks who were senior managers or maybe even director level who were, coming in as more of a, you know, staff or principal engineer and, and going kind of back to the IC level. So I think um, staying flexible uh, is, uh, is definitely important as you kind of shift from one company to another. Uh, by the way, one small announcement that we will, as you know, this unboxing XR Dev Careers is an event series. We are uh, inviting also um, game studios uh, leads as well here. Uh, and uh, probably a studio who has who has been working for a while on one of the top AAA franchises to bring it to VR. Uh, they will be uh, our guest speakers uh, next month. So I just want to tease that as well, since we are talking about game part. So uh, yeah, you will be informed uh, about that as well. And where is medical training VR currently used? Is there a goal to be used in colleges, hospitals? Is it about skill transfer, skill acquisition at existing uh, uh, surgeons? Where do you see fit in the, in the market? So primarily at the moment, our customers are big medical device companies um, and they are using the product to train their sales teams, to train potential end users, to train surgeons who will be using the product in the field. Um, that's kind of our, our bread and butter right now. Uh, we have like a small scale engagement with a number of medical schools, which we call the uh, OTN, also training network. Um, and that's something that we see uh, being a, a growth area in future is kind of directly training medical students. Um, but that's kind of, uh, at the moment, it's a, it's a much smaller part of the business. Um, but really, I think, you know, anywhere where 
like our vision is anywhere where medical training is needed and the collaborative training is a big part of um we see training whole teams together so it's not all, always just about the surgeon right there are um, surgical techs who have to assemble the equipment there are the nursing staff who are all have to work together as a team and, and one of the things that we um, see going forward is is really putting more emphasis on that like training a team together uh, on a procedure and not just the focus on just the surgeon which is kind of where we've primarily been focused uh, so far so yeah there is um our goal is for it to be used everywhere where surgery needs to be done to train to train people and ultimately like we say improve patient outcomes and encourage the adoption of higher value technologies Perfect. Uh, Ferhan, any uh, questions? Um, uh, Ryan, do you want to jump in for some advice? Um, actually, Mohamed is uh, in our uh, round table as well. He is now uh, enrolled to the prototyping bootcamp. Uh, he has actually a robotic background, um, robotic and mechanics background, and he is really interested on in uh, different uh, use cases, including medical. Uh, I just want to give him the stage to ask his question. I think it's it's a technical question for Matt. Thank you. Hey, Mohamed. Hi, uh, thanks for ending the talk. And before I ask the question, I just want to mention that the presentation was a lot reassuring the values and the career path I am working towards. And yeah, thanks for that. So uh, come to the question. So. Uh, you guys work with medical training devices and stuff so and i see that you're using uh, oculus and uh, which uses basically inside out tracking so uh so the when i work with and also with my experience there's a lot of uh, sort of like uh, tracking jitters and uh, this thing based on the environment so based on the each environment if the lighting is not good and the opposite goes for the vibes so if if it's a dark room, it's good, and so so on. So, how do you manage to, like uh, this sort of uh, tracking um, uh, jitters and these things in, when you're actually showing it, uh, like in a demo session or something? Uh, for one of the examples, so and I can think of was like when you're making incision or something. And uh, so during the incision, like if there's a jitter, so there's this latency in the real scene. So how how is there an additional hardware or custom algorithm you're working on? So how do you go about uh, these uh, tracking issues? So yeah, we, we don't do anything like custom in terms of hardware. We use Quest 2s out the box as like our, our current like primary target platform. Um, so it's definitely can be an issue. Um, so we, we have what we call a partner success team. Uh, part of their role is to help our customers understand how to use the technology to its best effect. And that includes how to set up a room for training such that the lighting and the environment is like optimal for tracking purposes. So that's one way we address it. Um, we also try and steer clear of um, interactions that would require incredibly precise tracking where that's beyond what the technology is currently capable of. So, um, you know, we find the tracking generally is, is pretty good as long as you, you set things up reasonably, um, good enough for most purposes, but we, we would steer away from, um, yeah, an interaction that relied too heavily on a level of tracking precision, which just, isn't there at the moment um, but, but in general we find the quest 2 is pretty good and um, for our customers typically we find that the convenience factor of not needing to set up tracking stations and all that kind of thing that you would have for the vive vastly outweighs like the small improvement in tracking performance um, i think yeah that stuff is probably more important if you're doing like a, a twitch shooter type of game than it is for like the, the, the typical content that we're making um, Improvements in tracking is always something we want to see, but it, it's, I would say it's not like our, it's not in our list of top concerns in terms of what we'd like to see in the technology right now, um, but improvements are always great, so. We see more uh, mobile devices coming out with uh, um, advanced specs. Uh, do you, uh, are you locked in, in the, the quest or you have an open platform that eventually will address um, most of the, the headsets and the manufacturers that will jump into the race. So we want to take the product wherever there, there's like a, a suitable technology to support it. Um, Quest 2 is, you know, again, we're, we're still a startup, even though we're a growing startup and we have to kind of 
focus our resources and make choices about where we want to prioritize. And so far, Quest 2 has been like the optimal balance for us of like mm -hmm. not having to support a wide range of different platforms, but delivering um, in the areas that we think are like key. But we, we're constantly evaluating different headsets. Like I've got a variety of headsets around here now, some of which are on evaluation loans from different companies. Um, and we're just kind of always keeping an eye on the state of the market and deciding what when is the right time to, to support other devices, mm -hmm. but certainly we're not like tied wedded to the quest two forever, but it, it's just where we see the, the overall best balance right now today of, um, like cost, uh, technology, um, support, all those kind of factors that we take into consideration. There was an earlier question about, uh, wearables I'll extend it to, um, uh, join it with the, the headsets that we see now. Uh, having biosensors, are you interested in measuring cognitive loads um, um, and have more of a, um, a bio marker based and uh, proficiency based um, uh, rating for executing a, on a on a procedure? I feel like I'm giving similar answers to a lot of these questions. Like it's it's something we keep an eye on. We're, we're interested in it, but again, it's just mm -hmm. we haven't yet seen that it's like hit that sweet spot of like delivering sufficient value relative to the cost and complexity of implementation, all those things. But I think that it will become a, a part of the, what we want to support in future. Um, but it's not something we're like mm -hmm. actively investing in today. So. Okay. I mean, I can also understand you are deploying hundreds of, uh, like seats to Johnson Johnson and many other clients, right? It's, it should be something that can be easily uh deployable and uh, yeah th that's actually makes sense maybe if your clients only needs a few seats that might be worth to explore but uh yeah that's yeah that's our, yeah our biggest deployments are in the thousands of headsets and and like yeah. those those customers their biggest concern is we want to get this in the hands of as many people as possible um yeah. because it's already good it already brings us a lot of value um and so at the moment the focus for them is like what's our best way to roll this out on a, on a bigger scale. Um, yeah. one, once sort of the technology becomes adopted, I think we'll see more place for these like, uh, more niche, often more expensive headsets that have extra functionality, but it will, I don't think at the moment it's, it's what their, our customers or our biggest yeah. focus on. We really want to just take what we've got and get it into the hands of as many doctors as we can. So, yeah. Perfect. Are we getting close to have yeah. a, uh, a little summary? Of, yeah. uh, the key learnings and uh, the takeaways from this uh, session. What do you think, Farhan? Yeah, I mean, maybe uh, from Matt and John, what would be the one advice that you would give uh, to everyone here? Because there, I'm also seeing a lot of people who are saying that I'm from medical background with zero coding, zero VR, AR development experience. So what would be your maybe uh, like one piece of advice that we can take away from this uh, event. Do you want to go first, John, or should I? <laughs> uh, sure, I'll jump in really quickly for the, I guess, the folks with maybe the medical background, but without, <clears throat> you know, the coding or, or VR um, uh, experience, I would say, you know, maybe take, take some coding classes, get involved in some boot camps, join some, some meetup groups, and kind of get involved in the, in the VR community. And I think that in, in short order, you'll probably have a pretty good Good grasp on on the ecosystem, and uh, and pretty easy to to make that jump. I think. Yeah, for sure, for sure, I agree. I would say one advice I pass on to a lot of people is every company I work with uses different job titles for different things, and everyone's got transferable skills. So even though you might have not had experience in something per se if you're looking for the same job title another company might call it something slightly different or completely different in some cases um and your skills could match up entirely just because the job title isn't the same doesn't mean it's the right match so have a real in detail look at all their jobs and what they actually are looking for rather than just going off a job title and yeah probably what i would say is like if that's something you're interested in buy a quest to download unity and, and just get started. You know, like at the end of the day, you can, you can spend a lot of time trying to figure out what technology should I learn first. It doesn't have to be unity download Unreal. just, just get started. And 
you know, I think there's lots of great courses out there, like the XR Bootcamp stuff. There's also lots of great free material, but like at the end of the day, you, the only way you're going to learn this stuff is to start doing it and make mistakes and, and figure out what works, what doesn't. Um, and uh, there's no time like the present to just get going and open up Unity and make a mess and then do better next time. <laughs> yeah, perfect advice. Uh, I, 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 I'm also telling to everyone who has uh, no coding skill or having a design path, I'm telling like, if you have a, already an interest or experience on a specific field or area, and you are subject matter expert or engineer or medical expert on something, use this as an opportunity to build a prototyping uh, uh, skill and experience uh, on VR, AR, and combine this together. I think uh, the industry needs more people who has a subject matter expertise on one area plus prototyping skill. And you don't necessarily need to be a software architect or a high level software developer, but believe me, like you will be much more uh, be preferred among other developers since you have both skills like subject matter expertise and uh, prototyping skills. I think this is the value that you can easily reach uh, in a few months of programs or in a few years of your self work. So uh, exactly as Matt said, just start building something today. So Thanks. let's close with your wisdom. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's great. So thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Thanks to John, Matt, also we are Vangelis and all the people joining us. And uh, it was quite an interesting um, conversation. Uh, for those who already registered, we will also share some of the key takeaways and recording of this session. So you can already go back and then share with your friends as well. And till the next Unboxing XR Dev Careers event, uh, see you soon and uh, stay healthy and stay with VR and AR. Bye. Thanks a lot. Everybody. Thanks for having us. Appreciate Thank it. You. Bye. Yeah, thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. Bye.